it. That seems to work. Take the rod and smite the rock. Okay. Right. So we've been working our way through Exodus, chapters 3 and 4. As you remember, we were in it a few weeks ago. We've been working our way through. Are, are connected as the Lord appears to Moses. Uh, the outlines we were using from Dr. Wearsby, which are very good, and we enjoy those. And the Lord appeared to Moses in the beginning of the church, uh, third chapter. Then he appointed Moses to be his prophet. Moses had a few questions about being a prophet, didn't think he was uh, worthy to uh, speak for God. And by the way, I don't think any of us feel worthy to speak for the Lord. And so the Lord has answers for Moses and spiritually has answers for us uh, uh, when we feel we're not worthy. The first answer is, um, I am the Lord. Don't worry about who you are. We're talking about the Lord. So Moses says, who am I? And the Lord says, well, I am with thee. And then he says, well, um, who is sending me? What shall I say? And the Lord says, well, just speak my name. And today we know the best thing we can do is just speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to do that. Especially, and, and I'm guilty sometimes and not doing it as well as I ought to. I often give a praise and glory to the Lord. And I hope they know who I'm talking about. But sometimes you've got to remind them. Because there are songs like, you know, George Harrison, <laughs> My Sweet Lord, uh, Lord, what was that name? Uh, Hare Krishna, Maya Triya. I mean, and those aren't, that's not the Lord. That's right. The Lord Jesus Christ is the God of the Bible according to the New Testament. This is the true God, John tells us in his first epistle in the fifth chapter. The Lord Jesus Christ is the true God. And so the name we're supposed to say is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I remember we were in the operating room yesterday and talking about some things. They were talking politics, conservatives and liberals and uh, making the point that the thing about a liberal, someone was saying, was anytime the liberal wants to do something, he wants you to pay for it. You know, if he wants some kind of a program, it's going to tax it so you can pay for his idea rather than pay out of his own pocket. And what do I think about that? And I said, I think that if someone has something that they love doing, uh, that'll put their own money where their mouth is. I said, for example, I, I love the church. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I give my money at the local church house. I would never want to make a, a tax law where people had to give their money to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that's right. I think it should come from the heart. And so that's what I said. Amen. And we need to mention that, that name, that precious name that's above all, all names. So, so he had a lot of questions for the Lord, and the Lord answered him. Uh, and when he said, well, I'm not sure they'll believe me, the Lord showed him signs and wonders. And again, we looked at that. Israel is a, is a particular nation that God chose in the Old Testament, in the dispensation of the law, to birth that nation under signs and wonders. That's not how the church is birthed in the New Testament. But this is how the Old Testament nation of Israel was birthed under signs and wonders. If there is a sign and a wonder for the birth of the church, it's at Calvary. It's the sign and the wonder that the angels are still trying to plumb the depths of is why would God die for their sins? Why would their creator who made them innocent and then they sinned against him not make them pay for the penalty? That's a sign and a wonder to think about. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the sign and wonder of the New Testament is Calvary's cross and the Lord Jesus hanging there, commending his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, he's paying the price for our sins. But going back to the Old Testament, mighty signs and wonders of judgment were wrought on this nation, Egypt, and we will see it. So Moses is giving all these uh, answers by the Lord. So now he is told to go back to see his brother, and to go to the Pharaoh. So we pick it up in verse 18 of the fourth chapter, and now we're going to see God continue to assure Moses. Verse 18, And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren, which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said unto Moses, uh, Go in peace. So I'll just stop there at that verse and just take a look at this for a second. Now, Moses has been out on the backside of the desert. He has been tending to the sheep, and he sees the burning bush. And he has what probably might have been the greatest experience in his life when he personally met the Lord, at least for the very first time, <laughs> and God spoke to him great and precious truths face to face. And now God had told him, I'm going to send you as my prophet 
back to the Pharaoh to let my people go. So I've commissioned you with a job to do. I've appointed you to be my prophet and my minister. So he's coming back now. It's five o'clock. He's punched out. The whistle blows. And he's heading back to the, to the, to the ranch where Jethro is. And, and he says to him, now, I'm glad he did this. He, he came and he spoke with him. In other words, even though he had been given an appointment and a commission by God, that was no reason to ignore the family he had married into. He still went humbly and, and said, uh, let me go, I pray thee, and return to my brethren which are in Egypt. I think the point that the Lord wants to teach us here is that, you know, we read our Bible and we get excited about something the Lord would have us to do. And sometimes what we need to do is, is just tell a family member that we're going to be doing something. For example, let's say in your family it's always been tradition that, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, certain Sundays y'all get together for family gatherings. And, and now you're meeting God in the Word of God. And you're seeing that the time of fellowship and the church is a place where God likes to have his people together to worship him. And after all, that's what we're created to do is to worship God. Well, then maybe a good thing to do would be and go and say to some of the family members, say, you know, I love our time together on Sundays, but, you know, we usually start these things around 12 o'clock noon. And if it's okay with you, if I may, you know, I like to attend church in the morning. And would it be all right if I go to church early in the morning and then and if I finish up at 12.15 or 12.30, I come a little later. Let me go, I pray thee, to be with my brethren and see how things are with them. See, you see the manner he's taught to have good manners. This is a good teaching right here. A very simple thing as to how to, to deal with inter-family members who aren't quite believers. I mean, Jethro is not a believer here. Jethro doesn't know the Lord. Jethro, as you remember, was a priest of Midian. We saw that back in the second chapter, verse 16. He's the priest of Midian. What did that mean? It meant nothing in terms of relationship with God. What about most priests on the planet today? They know nothing in terms of a relationship with God. Okay. Most religious men are lost. That's what we learn in the Bible. So, so Moses now understands, this guy doesn't know God, but I know God, and God wants me to do something. Let me politely go and just mention to him that I'd like to be with my brethren. And so he, he, he comes and he asks him. This is showing honor. I mean, this man is his father-in-law. He's honoring his father-in-law. Jethro said, go in peace. He said, go in peace. That's interesting. I saw that phrase again in the book of Judges, chapter 18. Go back to, go to Judges, <laughs> chapter 18. I've heard that phrase before, go in peace. Judges, chapter 18, uh, after the five books of the law, after Deuteronomy is Joshua and then Judges. And in the 18th chapter, we read about a, uh, another priest that didn't know the Lord. And uh, he had some people coming to him that were going to do something they ought not to have done. These were some of the Danites. And they were going to attack a city without God having told them to attack it. And they were going to take over a city that they should not have taken over. And so they went and they spoke to uh, this priest, uh, verse 5, And they said unto him, to the priest, Ask counsel, we pray thee, of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. And of course, there's no way God's going to prosper them from doing something where he's, they're going to attack innocent people. And the priest said unto them, Go in peace. Go in peace. A lot of priests say that. Here's two examples in the Bible of two priests that don't know God saying, go in peace. Just food for thought. We'll go back to where we're in Exodus. It's not the peace of God they're telling you to go in. <laughs> the peace of God's going to be found in the Word of God. So anyways, I think Moses did the right thing in showing fil honor to, to his father. They call it filial honor. And, and, uh, and he did that. But I notice another thing about Moses. Being... I would say, young in the Lord at this point, having just met the Lord, curiously, he doesn't tell him that he's doing something for the Lord. All he tells him is that he just wants to be with his brethren. He doesn't quite have the uh, strength of conviction and knowledge yet to speak on God's behalf. So God's going to continue to work with him. Because right after this verse, the Lord's going to speak to him some more to give him more assurances. I think based on the way he asked Jethro to go, the Lord sensed 
he's not still entirely certain in his heart. He's trying to obey me, but I can see he's, he's wavering in his heart. And so the Lord's going to give him more assurance here in the next few verses. I'll pick it up in verse 19. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go, return unto Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. Now, now it's possible one of the reasons that Moses didn't tell Jethro that he was about to go to the Pharaoh is, is you know, Jethro would put two and two together and say, wait a second, you're going to go tell the Pharaoh to let the people go. You're a nobody. You're a shepherd. He's a mighty Pharaoh with a big army. You're going to offend that powerful man. Uh, you don't exactly go to communist dictators <laughs> and tell them, let my people go. They're liable to have you beheaded or throw you in a gulag. And let's see, you're married to my wife, and those are my grandkids. You're putting my whole family at risk. So I think Moses had some fear, and the Lord's reassuring him, you go, you return. First, I want you to know, all the men are dead which sought thy life. And, and the Lord has, has seen to that one aspect of safety for Moses. And so now Moses, having a little more confidence, verse 20, Moses took his wife and his sons, and he set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Remember that rod. He said, now you take that rod. Wherever you go, you take the rod. You're going to use that for my signs and wonders. Remember, we saw the rod of God is a type of the word of God. And for a Christian, the spiritual application is you make sure you have the word with you wherever you go. You want to have the word with you. We need to be armed with the word of God. That's our sword. That's our shield. That's our breastplate. That's our helmet. We need to be armed with that. So Moses made sure that he took the rod of God in his hand. Uh, are you sure you have the rod of God with you when you go out? Do you have the word with you? In some way, shape, or form, at the very least hidden in your heart? That's what you need. So he goes, and, and as he's going, verse 21, the Lord said unto him, now he's going to continue to assure Moses, because Moses needs assurance. By the way, you ever feel that way, folks? You ever feel like you need assurance? I know I do a lot. I pray for it and ask. That's all right. Again, the Bible is written to show you how God works in people's lives. Not in the lives of super saints, but in the lives of simple saints. Moses is a simple saint. He's a simple person that God worked with because he had a heart to want to know God. If you have a heart to want to know God, he'll work in your life too. These stories are written to encourage and comfort you. And so now the Lord continues to speak to his servant. The Lord will continue to speak to you as long as you have the rod of God with you. See? Without the rod, how can God speak? Without the word, how can he speak? See, we need that word so God can speak to us. Moses had the rod. He had the word. The Lord speaks to him. And the Lord continues to assure him. He said, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou uh, do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. Now, this is curious here, and I'm glad it's written, but we need to put our thinking caps on and learn a few things, because this, this sounds pretty rough, doesn't it? There, there are some people that misinterpret this verse to think um, that, that the Lord is hardening Pharaoh's heart in such a way that he cannot be saved, and therefore he's going to die and go to hell. And the hardening of the heart is the cause of damnation in the Pharaoh. That's some of the confusion that comes out of this passage. There's a group of people called Calvinists, based on the teaching of a man that lived centuries ago named John Calvin, a young Roman Catholic man in his 20s who had been steeped in Roman Catholicism. And I believe he got saved from reading his works, although I'm not 100% certain, but I think he did. But very soon after his salvation, within two or three years after his salvation, he's writing books about Christianity, which is unbiblical. Read Timothy. A novice should not teach, <laughs> lest he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And this man wrote these books, and in his books, one of the goofy theories he came up with was this concept called uh, election and predestination, where certain people are elected and predestined to be saved, and others are elected and predestined to go to hell and to be damned. And no matter what, it doesn't matter. Either you're one of the saved and the elect, or you're one of the lost, and, and that's just it. You can cry for mercy all your life. It won't matter. God's not going to save you if you're one like Pharaoh. You've been chosen by God to be damned, made to be damned. That's what they got out of verse like that. They use these kind of verses to support their uh, teachings. Let me show you something. God is not speaking about salvation 
in this verse. Nothing about salvation is mentioned. He's talking about a situation of delivering his people against a polit- from a political leader. He's talking about governmental affairs. So let me give you a verse. Turn to Proverbs chapter 21. When you get to uh, Proverbs chapter 21, put your finger there and then go a couple more books to the right to the book of Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 4. Now, now here's something that God would have us to understand as Christians. <coughs> God has allowed the earth after the fall of sin and the deception of the the devil he has allowed the devil to become the god with a little g of this world and he's the prince of the power of the air and he has his way a lot down here but god still has ultimate control and ultimate say over that which the devil does in the book of job you saw that when the devil wanted to attack job he said you can do such and such but you can't do this and you can do such and such but you can't do this and what god's letting you know is the, the, the lion, the devil, is on a leash. Okay? He's got him under control. And, de- and, and God has things under control down here. And so in Daniel chapter 4, this entire chapter is written, Nebuchadnezzar, a Gentile ruler, like the Pharaoh, writes an entire chapter to let people know that God's in charge down here, ultimately. And uh, he, he said, uh, verse 16, Nebuchadnezzar writing to all the people, verse 1, at verse 16, God said, Let his heart be changed from man's. Let a beast's heart be given unto him. Let seven times, that seven years pass over him. Th- this matter is by the decree of the watchers and by the demand, by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know, here it is, that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. And then he'll, he'll, he'll repeat this uh, in verse uh, 25, and he'll repeat it again in verse 32. Three times in the same chapter, he wants you to know, uh, end of verse 25, that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Uh, verse 32, at the end of this, you see the same thing. The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Ultimately, God's in charge. And when a man then is on the throne, because all the thrones and all the dominions and all the principalities have been ordained of God. And when a man's on that throne, God often will let him, like a moving chess piece, move about as he wants. But if something that man's doing is going to interfere with one of God's plans, dealing with his people and his son, every so often God will reach down and move that piece. Or God will reach down into the heart of that piece and say, go left rather than right on this move. So now go to Proverbs 21 and you'll see how God does it. He doesn't even have to do it by circumstance. He often works right down in the hearts of the leaders on the throne. Uh, Proverbs 21 verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. So, so what's happening here is God is showing you, we're going to go back to Exodus and we're going to put it together a little more so we can think about this. This is kind of deep, but it's good we explore it because we don't want to be Calvinists. We want to be Christians, born again Christians. We don't follow Calvin. We don't follow Luther. We don't follow John Wesley. We don't follow Mike. We follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for us. We want to be Christians. They were first called Christians in Antioch, and we'd like to still be called Christians today in Williamsville and Clarence and Amherst. Okay, So we want to follow the Bible. We don't want to be Calvinists about this. What the Lord is just showing you is giving you an x-ray of the fact that the Lord has plans, sovereign plans, decreed plans, uh, uh, determined plans in his foreknowledge and counsel. And he's not going to let a man interfere with it. So... What he wants to do here, going back to Pharaoh, why would he harden the Pharaoh's heart on this particular event? Well, the Pharaoh has shown some hardness in his heart already. 
He's been afflicting and oppressing God's people. And he has not responded to the cries from the people down there. I mean, I'm sure Jewish mothers have cried over what's been done to their children, over what's been done to their husbands and to their young sons. And, and, and he's hardened his heart to the cries of the people. And what he's saying right here is God saying, when you come before this Pharaoh, I can already, I can see this guy. This guy responds to magical power. He's got Janus and Jamborees. You're going to meet them in a little bit, a couple of his magicians in his court. And, and, and when you come along with greater power, he might be impressed enough to go along with you. And I don't want that because I've got some real plans here. And if he compromises, my people could stay enslaved another hundred years down here. And the Amorites' iniquity is full, and I intend to move them. And God knows what he's planning on doing, how he wants to move these people to the land. And so he's not going to let Pharaoh interfere with the plans that he set. In other words, his, his purposes are going to be achieved in his time. And Pharaoh's not going to get a chance to compromise. Another thing God's doing, turn to Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. Not only is God going to deliver his people from a wicked ruler that's been oppressing his people, but he also wants to bring judgment on the false religions that are around that wicked ruler. And if this Pharaoh were to, wow, those miracles are pretty neat. I'd like to have some power like that, like that, uh, that Simon the Sorcerer in the book of Acts. And if he compromises and changes, it would, it would mess up the timing of God's plans. Let me tell you, God's plans come right on time. You think about the birth, death, burial, res resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he had been born 50 years earlier, the, the, the uh, crucifixion would not have occurred. If he had been uh, born 50 years later and Titus had destroyed the city at that point, the crucifixion would not have occurred. Everything needed, the timing was exactly right. And when it comes to timing involving his people, the Jews, and his son, who was born of a woman as a Jew, God's going to make sure the timing is right. Now, not only is he going to do that, he wants to bring judgment on false religion. So in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12, he tells you, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Not those little idols and those false religions. And so God had a twofold purpose in hardening Pharaoh's heart. A hardening process that Pharaoh had already begun. God's just going to speed it up a little bit. And we'll see that as we go through the next few chapters. So, so go back to where we were in Exodus chapter 4. So God is, is telling Moses a number of things. Boy, isn't God good to us, folks? He really lets us in on, on secrets. I mean, the secrets of the Lord will be revealed unto his servants, the prophets. That's what the Bible tells us. He'll reveal the things that he's doing in the hearts of other people. So Moses, here's this getting ready to go to do a mission for God. And first he's worried about those men. Those men are dead. And then, and then not, only this, not only are the men dead, but I want you to go forward and to preach to the Pharaoh. You tell him what I tell you to say. For example, verse 22, And thou shalt say unto the Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Pharaoh, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And he gives, he gives Moses a message, not unlike the message that he gave to Ezekiel. He said, I send thee to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled, and, and, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And by the way, Moses, they're going to forbear. But that's none of your business. Speak my words anyways. I've given you the words to speak. By the way, I'm going to harden his heart. He's not going to listen anyways. But you still do your duty. Mm -hmm. Now, as Christians, we need to thank God that he shows us right here in the Bible. Jesus tells us openly and plainly, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. And few find it, but broad is the gate 
and, and, and wide is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. He's already told you. You know what he said? Most of these people are going to continue on the broad way to destruction. But go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And their hearts may be hard, but go ye and preach the gospel. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, you can be a faithful ambassador unto me. Yes. That's what he tells Moses. That's what he tells you. That's what he tells me. Now, he uses the interesting phraseology here in, in the 22nd verse. Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Israel is my son. Out of the nations on earth, God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, hath chosen this nation, hath chosen them to be a father unto the nation, and them to be his children. Even my firstborn, out of this nation would come his firstborn, his only begotten. What a blessing. One, one day and in, in later on in the Bible, you'll see that uh, God tells them, I didn't choose you because you were great. I chose you be because you were little among the thousands. Mm -hmm. I mean, God's got the heart that you and I have. I remember watching just a little bit of, of a basketball game once, and there was this team. They were so big, and they were so talented and so athletic, and they had been beating everyone. And this little team got into the final game against them. This is way back in 1985. I think it was Georgetown and Villanova. And Villanova didn't stand a ghost of a chance. This little itty-bitty school with these little players and this big, huge, monstrous team. There was, and, and I was rooting for the underdog. You ever get that way? God roots for the underdog. He chose Israel. He chose the underdog. And today, straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few find it. We're the underdogs. God's chosen us. Isn't that a blessing? It's not it good to be saved. Don't you love it? I love it. Anyway, so he, he said, I just want you to see this. Israel is my son. Now, he uses this terminology to Hosea. In, right after Daniel, we were in Daniel before. The book after Daniel is Hosea, chapter 11. He, he delivered the nation from oppression of the Assyrian pharaoh ruler. When you deliver something, you get a baby, don't you? Okay. He delivered them. So, so Hosea 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. It was that he delivered them from the nation of Egypt. He delivered a small nation from a large nation. There was a delivery, and he had his son. And Israel is God's people. They're still his chosen people. However, Paul tells us in the New Testament, not all Israel is Israel. You're not just a Jew because you're one outwardly and you're circumcised in the flesh. You need circumcision of the heart, circumcision of the spirit, where you've put off the works of the law and you've put on the righteousness of Christ. But as a nation, as a physical people, these are God's people. Today as a spiritual nation. And by the way, when a Jew takes Jesus Christ as a Savior and they get circumcised in the heart and they get the new birth, they now move from a physical to a spiritual plane. They're still physically a Jew, but now spiritually in Christ, they're neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free, or all one in Christ. So going back to Exodus, Moses has some good, assuring, confident words with him. And that's the way you and I should go out with the blessed assurance, knowing that the God of the universe has given us exactly what to say. We don't have to make... Remember when, when we were... Um, when Wild Bill came here, and he said, you know what, we got to get you on TV. And I said, come on. <laughs> he said, no, I'm going to work it out. And he, and he talked to Joey, and he talked to some people, and talked to, I think it was Brother Doug, and got the connections at Adelphia. And when we were talking to Adelphia <laughs> about, about being on TV, one of the concerns they had was, you know, you're going to run out of material. Most people that do these programs after half a year, after a year, they're off. I mean, watch, you see how they go off the air. What about, do you have enough material? I said, 
I'm not writing the script. I've got the scriptures. They're written. I got about 20 years worth of material here. I mean, that's what we're doing here. I've got the, and so it's been years. We've been on two hours of fresh material a week from the scriptures. I'm not coming up with this stuff. Isn't that great? We go out. We don't have to come up with the script. We don't need ghostwriters. We got the Holy Ghost. He already wrote everything for us. So, so, so Moses is, is going in great assurance. And, and, and now a very curious small paragraph is going to occur here in verses 24 through 26 as it gets uh, ready to go. So he's got his wife and he's got his children and they're on. And uh, verse 24, and it came to pass, by the way, in the inn, that the Lord met him, that's Moses, and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah, that's his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet. And, and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. And then she said, A bloody husband thou art, because of the circumcision. What's that all about? <laughs> can someone please explain that to me? I don't have, I don't have anything here. Can, can I get any help? All right, let's take a look at this, see what's happening. There, there's a principle at work here. There's a principle at work here that God wants to reveal to you and to me in the scriptures. Moses has met God. Moses has been given the word of God. And so now watch how God, how does God think about his children? He just said, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. Moses is going, wow, I'm an Israelite indeed. I'm, a, I'm of the tribe of Levi. That means I'm one of God's children. I'm one of God's sons. Okay, you're a Christian indeed. You've taken Christ as your Savior. You want, you're one of God's children. You're one of God's sons or daughters. We've got God's word. What does it mean? Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. There's a principle in play here. And, and we'll see it. It's a good thing we have the New Testament or I wouldn't know what to say about that. What, what's going on here? God wants to kill Moses? 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse 17 is the principal verse. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? After all, they don't know the gospel. They don't have the gospel. They're not entrusted with the gospel. They're not even saved. But what about those of us that have been entrusted with the gospel? We're stewards not of money, we're stewards of the oracles of God, of the manifold mysteries of God. We're stewards of the gospel of grace. That's what we're stewards of. That's the greatest possession you and I have. I know all the modern Christian American teachers want to teach that we're stewards of money, and that's okay, but that's, that's small potatoes. That's small change compared to the Bible you hold in your hands. Mm -hmm. That's the riches of Christ you have. And so we're stewards of the gospel of God, and, and, and God expects something of his children. And God does not judge them that are without. Judgment begins at the house of God. Now Moses is in for a little spanking here. Uh, turn back a few books to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. Before Hebrews, find 1 Timothy and find chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3, picking it up in verse 1. Now, this will kind of sort of apply to a person in Moses' position. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop be, be like an overseer, a pastor. It'd be like a shepherd of a flock. Here's Moses, the shepherd of a flock. Moses is now going to be the shepherd of God's people. He's going to have the office of a bishop overseeing those people. That's a good work to have. There are certain requirements. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. There goes all your Catholic bishops. They just let out with that verse. <laughs> I guess they're not really bishops. And we know they're not. Okay, I mean, they're bishops of a religion, but they're not God's bishops. A bishop, a true saying, 
must be blameless and the husband of one wife. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Now Moses is good at all these things. Moses had a wife, he had children. Moses was a, a vigilant person, he watched out for the flock. He was sober, he wasn't a drunkard, there's no record of him in the Bible doing anything like that. He's of good behavior. We saw how he went to Jethro and said, I'd like to go back to my people and see how my brethren are doing. Given to hospitality, apt to teach, you're going to see he's a great teacher. Not given to wine. All these wonderful things. Verse 4. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, for from man know not how to rule his house, how shall he take care of the church of God? All right. Now we saw in that passage that Moses firstborn son wasn't circumcised. Now circumcision was a very important covenant that God had given to the Jewish people, to his son Israel. Matter of fact, if you're not sure, turn back to um, chapter 17 of Genesis. Genesis chapter 17, just to see how God words it. And while you're turning, I'm going to get some water. This is the finest bottled water that is in this bottle right, right from my tap. You buy one bottle and you put tap water in. That's what I do. Genesis 17. Verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, Father Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Now notice very carefully, verse 11, it's a token of the covenant. It's not the covenant. The covenant is one of that I love God. And I've given my heart to God, as Abraham had done, and, and bowed before the Lord. And, and Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it him to righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. It's a heart covenant, but God says, I'm going to give you an outward token of the inward covenant. Back. Um, and so, so this is given here. Now notice what he says, verse 13. Um, he that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with money, must needs be circumcised. And, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Now when Moses was a little baby, his mom and dad circumcised him. And when Moses fled from Egypt and came to the land of Midian and he met this Midian priest, this Midianite priest and the daughter, Jochebed, who was grown up in a Midianite household. This is a religion that knows not God. Moses intermarried. That happens. Now Moses ought to have led that woman in the ways of the Lord. And instead that woman took his heart away and from God for a while. So much so that when the first child was born, Moses kind of acquiesced. She probably said, you know, is it really necessary for us to... We, we don't do that here in Midian. We don't circumcise our babies. There's no... Re it's kind of bloody, you know. I mean, it'll hurt the child. And they haven't invented Novocaine and Lidocaine. After all, Moses is 1492 B.C. That stuff's not going to come around for, for millennium. We can't, we can't do this to the little baby. And, and let's ask my dad. He's a priest. What do you think about that? Is circumcision necessary? Well, not around here. That's not What's necessary is you take a pig and you put an apple in its mouth and then you roast that and God accepts that as a sacrifice. That's just fine. And so Moses didn't circumcise that child. Now what happened is later on, by the time the second one came, Moses had taught Jochebed enough in the ways of the Lord that the second child 
was circumcised. As a matter of fact, you can even tell in the names of the two children. The, name, the first child is named Gershon, which means an alien or a stranger. By the time they have that second child, he's taught Jacobet enough and converted her to God that they name the second child Eliezer, which means God is my help. Now that happens. But that first child hadn't been circumcised. And I think probably what happened also is when the woman came to saving knowledge of the Lord and the next baby was born, she did the right thing with Moses and they circumcised a the child. And they probably asked this question back and forth. Do you think it's necessary for us to go back and circumcise the first little boy? After all, by now he's nine years old. It would really hurt to do it at this point in time. I mean, if you think it hurts at eight days, imagine nine years old. And God understands at this point. After all, I wasn't saved at that time and now I am saved. And there's no need to, it's only a token of a covenant. And we've given our heart to the Lord. We don't need to keep the token. So what happens is Moses is guilty of committing a sin of omission. A sin of omission. Now this is something that Christians we're beginning to understand. In the, in the, in the insurance world they have, they have errors of omission and errors of commission. A, a, a sin or a, an error of commission is when you actually do something you ought not to do. For example, uh, it says thou shalt not commit adultery. If you commit adultery, you've committed a sin of commission. You've committed adultery. But in the New Testament, and even to God's men in the Old Testament, there's a higher standard than just thou shalt not. There are things you ought to do. As a matter of fact, James puts this in the New Testament in James chapter 4. This token of this covenant that God established was a good thing. Or God would not have established it. God... Jesus went about doing good. When the young ruler came to Jesus one day, he said, Oh, oh, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looked at that man and he said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but God. And he was getting that young man to finally admit to the fact that Jesus was God. But the point being, all goodness flows from God. Anything God establishes is good. God established a good token of a covenant, and Moses kind of skipped over it. And it says right here in James chapter 4, verse 17, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, sin of omission, to him it, it's sin. It's not just enough not to commit adultery and not to steal and not to murder. There are good things God would have us to do. Of course, as a Christian, we know what the good thing is he'd like us to do, preach the gospel. That's a good thing we ought to be doing. And to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. Get that gospel out. Now Moses had something he was supposed to be doing that was good, and he didn't do it with his firstborn son. And, and, and I think he kind of vacillated back and forth and was weak on it and accepted some of the worldly arguments. But God didn't. Because the reason being this, when God is going to send a man out to be an overseer, he has to rule his own house before he can go out and lead God's people. God needs to prepare a man before he'll put a man in a pulpit. He's going to work with him quite a while in his home. I'll tell you this from personal experience. God did, that's one of the reasons he doesn't want a novice to get up there and teach. Because the first thing I had to learn was how to be a husband and how to be a father and how to be given to hospitality and how to be apt to teach right in my own home and all the things that God wanted to work with me in my house before he would ever want me up here in a pulpit talking to anyone. That's why he wants a bishop to have a wife. How could I talk to anyone about marriage and raising children if I'm not married and don't raise children? I don't know how, how a religious system can come up with an idea that you're not supposed to marry. Of course the Bible tells you in Timothy that's a doctrine of devils. How can you give advice on something you haven't walked through yourself? So God wanted Moses to do what he was supposed to do. Now what, what happened to him was <laughs> God laid him out with quite a strong illness there because Moses was so ill that Moses himself could not uh, perform the circumcision. So what was happening is the same principle that you find in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You see, when you take one of God's token covenants, uh, signs of his covenants, and you ignore them, there are going to be consequences to face. 
In the Old Testament, the token of the covenant was, was circumcision. In the New Testament, the only tokens of the covenant I know are two. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so right here in this chapter, Paul mentions uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Again, judgment begins at the house of God. You know how God would like the judgment to take place? You judge yourself if you're smart. You take the word of God and find out what you should be doing in there. But if you're not going to do what you're supposed to be doing in there, God may have to take his spanking hand upon you. And so he came against Moses here. It says in verse 24, it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him. The angel of the Lord met him. Probably very similar to what you see in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. This happened to David. See, when, 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 when God puts one of his men in a position of leadership, he really holds them to a high, to a high standard. First Chronicles chapter 21 and uh, verse 15. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. David had done something that had angered the Lord. And uh, they were paying for it. And as he was destroying uh, it, as he was destroying, the Lord beheld and it repented him of the evil. There's the mercy of God at work. And you can see mercy at work in Moses' life. God could have slain Moses there. But God was pulling back and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. That angel, see notice, uh, And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. And so the Lord's meeting Moses in the way, the angel of the Lord with the stretched out sword. And as he's beginning to move in smiting Moses, Moses is weak and sickly and can't even do that which he's supposed to do. And probably, you know, Zipporah was the one that had been so contentious in it that she was forced then to do that to save her son and to save Moses and probably save her own skin. I'm sure this was a terrifying sight for her. By the way, Honestly, and I need this probably more than you folks do. <laughs> we need to have some good fear of the Lord as God's children. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. We need, we need a little of it. Maybe once in a while the Lord should show us in a dream what the angel of the Lord looks like. Zipporah saw it. Moses saw it. David saw it. Probably good for Moses to see that because that had just encouraged him. He figured, boy... Now, if the Lord's given me mercy, and that angel's turned away from me, but now I know that angel's walking with me, and that angel's going to be the one judging Egypt, I have nothing to fear. Remember, you plus God makes a majority. That's all it takes. You want that angel on your side. And so, Zipporah, by the very testimony of her mouth, a bloody husband thou art, a bloody husband art thou unto me, thou because of the circumcision. Because of that, you could see... Although she went through the outward motion, her heart wasn't quite in it. But Moses' was. Because something's going to happen here. When this verse ends, you won't understand what happens until you get to, I believe it's the 18th chapter of Exodus. So turn there quickly. Remember, God looks upon the heart. Zipporah goes through the token of the covenant here to save her skin and to save her son and save her husband, but she's still angry about it. This is not a repentant heart. A bloody husband thou art, a bloody husband thou art. By the way, you ever get called that? We're always called bloody people because we believe in a bloody religion. Because we believe God wants blood. Well, he does. The soul that sinneth it shall die and, the, and the, the life of the flesh is in the blood and his blood I will require, the Lord says. Thankfully, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, the sister says. And she's correct. She's quoting Hebrews. Thankfully, the Lord Jesus Christ, he shed his blood on our behalf. And it's a funny thing. It's a funny thing. The whole world that will condemn us, a bloody religion you have, a bloody religion you have. 
The very ones that will not accept the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ are the ones that will turn around and shed everyone else's blood. Right. Fly airplanes into buildings, run around the Sudan on camels, shooting people, blowing people up, doing all these kinds of things that the religions have done for centuries. And those of us who have accepted the shed blood of Jesus Christ wouldn't harm a fly. I'd rather lie down and take the sword than ever use the sword on anyone. Amen. Isn't it good to be saved? What peace. What love of Christ constrains us and works in our heart. But Zipporah, she was still a little upset over this thing. Although she did it outwardly in where her heart wasn't right, Moses' heart was right. Because what happens is we see this. This is many, many weeks later. Moses has now been to the Pharaoh. Moses has now given the commands to the Pharaoh. God has exercised his judgments. The people have been delivered. And now they're coming out, two million strong, across the desert. And, and now we see this, uh, chapter 18, verse 1 and 2. When Jethro the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. And her two sons, which the name of one was Gershon, and the other LAAs are verse 4. So here's what happened. After this scene here, Moses realizing my, my wife's heart, she's still not really in this thing, sends her and the two sons back to Jethro in the land of Midian. And Moses is going to go on alone in the battle. Now, now, spiritually, what can I learn from this? I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord. And I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord in reference to other family members in their walk with the Lord. But, but you don't ever want to corral someone into doing something they don't, that their heart's not into. If their heart's not in it and you're trying to do God's work, don't corral, don't arm twist someone. Don't bring a Zipporah along with you just for outward purposes. If in their heart, that's a bloody, I don't want to. You want to go alone with God if that's all you can do. Now, thankfully, God's going to give him a, a fellow companion, a fellow co-laborer to work with him. We're not going to be able to get there tonight. We're not out of time, right, Joe? Oh, three more minutes, yeah. <laughs> Amen. We're getting close. Um, so, 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 Moses, having the wisdom at this point to realize, my wife's not really in this, and the kids are too young to be in it, sends them back. And they'll come along later. But God doesn't want you to do anything with an angry attitude like Zipporah. And God also wants you not to omit the important things that he's given to us. The ordinances of the New Testament, baptism and, and uh, the Lord's table, are very important to God. He established them. His son, you know, went through both of those ordinances. He said, let me do it to fulfill all righteousness. And he too instituted the Lord's table and celebrated it with his disciples. And so the Lord wants to show us this is important. He says, I know it, it doesn't affect your salvation. It didn't affect Moses' salvation there. It, it, but it's a token of the covenant that I've given. And you and I have the tokens and the ordinances of the, of the everlasting blood covenant of Jesus Christ. And the baptism is a picture of our death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus. And the Lord's table you and I take, and we do it in remembrance of Him, and we do show the Lord's death till He come, looking forward to the second coming. These are important things to God. We'll, we'll finish next week. Any questions? Lord, we do thank you for uh, the teachings here. They, they are deep. Uh, please help them to uh, settle deep into our hearts this week and to consider things, Lord, if we've been living in sins of omission Help us uh, for the men here, Lord. Uh, we do desire to be used of you, to be overseers in a sense, at least our very family. Help us, Lord, uh, not to commit any sins of omission. And by your spirit and, and by your grace and your power, uh, enable us to do that which you've commanded us to do. And uh, above all, help us not to uh, forsake the gospel of Christ, uh, to go out at all times, and to tell people that we love your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.